speaker is Maggie Doolin. She's a student from uh, SUNY Oneonta. She'll be speaking today about uh, combining molecules and morphology to understand diversity in neocatalrhynchus. Thank you guys for being here today. So um, my talk is from a little bit different perspective because I'm a parasitologist really by training. Um, less than a fisheries biologist, but I am dealing with a parasite population that affects fishes in the U.S. <clears throat> so, as Kurt introduced, I'll be, I'm looking at the diversity in this genus of Acanthus cephalin. It's a fish intestinal parasite called Neocanarhynchus, and I'm using both molecular and morphological data to kind of come to conclusions on species boundaries in this group. So, kind of first, I wanted to start off to say, all right, we're at a fisheries conference. I'm really talking about genetics of worms, so what's the issue here? You know, why, why would fisheries biologists care about fish acanthus cephalins? And if you can look here, I invite you to see the intestine dissected out of a white sucker here that every single thing that looks like a worm is a worm. So these, these acanthus cephalins are all embedded in the intestinal epithelium of a white sucker. And this is just kind of, uh, it's a relatively heavy infection, but you can see that that could do serious damage to the fish intestine as well as affecting um, nutrient absorption. So just keep that in mind as I go through my talk. Um, it's good to kind of see the pathology that these worms can cause. So to give you an outline of the talk, I'll be covering background information on my worms, talk about my project scope, the field work I've done so far, uh, molecular work I've completed, the morphological study I'm doing currently, and then future work. And this is a picture of a slide of an cephalin that I made from a worm that we collected. And I'll be referencing a lot to the proboscis of the worm. I'll be kind of using that as a snapshot to represent the species. So just to orient you, that's the anterior end of the worm that sticks into the intestine of the fish. So if you see pictures that look like that, that's what it is. So the background of Neocranorhynchus, as I said, it's an acanthocephalin, and the group acanthocephala are thorny-headed worms. Um, they have complex life cycles. So there are two or more hosts involved in completing the life cycle of these worms. Here's an example life cycle for Neocanorhynchus. It has an ostracod in intermediate host that is eaten by a fish, such as a largemouth bass, um, and it's going to be sexually mature and reproducing in the fish host. But sometimes, as you can see, there might be a trophic gap, for example, for a worm that's trying to get into a largemouth bass, it might not be eating an ostracod. So there might be a peritonic host or a host that bridges the trophic gap, such as a bluegill. In Neocanorhynchus, the definitive hosts, these hosts that, are, that the worms sexually mature in, are either fish or turtles. And there could be intestinal damage with heavy infection, like I showed you from that second slide. And Neocanorhynchus is this incredibly diverse species. This is the reason I'm studying, or incredibly diverse genus. It's the reason I'm studying the group, because there are 115 species. And in the group Acanthocephala, in total, there are only 1,600 species. So it's a very significant percentage of total Acanthocephala diversity. Um, it is really, really common in U.S. fishes, including game fishes. So if you have handled any of these fishes, especially if you've handled them regularly, especially in the state of New York, I can almost guarantee that you've also handled Neocanorhynchus as well, inside the fish. Um, there are 33 different species of Neocanorhynchus from the literature that are described from fishes, and there's no good reference system for the genus. So even though um, there are parasitologists who study this worm and fisheries biologists that may see it a lot if you look at the intestine of your fish ever. Um, you really can't tell which species is which. There's no really good reference system and there's no molecular data, so there's no kind of barcoding that you can send out worm tissue to get back a result of which species you're looking at. So this is a big issue for this group because it's so common. We really want to be able to track our parasite populations in our fish hosts, um, and how are we going to do that? So that's what I'm kind of doing for my project is trying to get a good uh, molecular database going and morphological database associated with that to be able to differentiate species. In my project, I'm only going to be able to study a subset of the 33 species in the United States because they're spread all over um, in different hosts across the U.S. But I'll be collecting samples from multiple type localities, and a type locality we refer to a lot in systematics is the locality where the worm was first described from, or the animal was first described from, and the type host is the species that first hosted those original worms that were described. So, so far we've gone to a site in southeastern New Hampshire. That's our first type locality for the species Neocanorhynchus prolixoides, which I have pictured here. These are the, the original drawings um, from the worms that they used to describe the species. And then once we have our 
important to want to use DNA sequence data to recognize these putative species. So we're hoping that when we put them in and use these certain molecular marker genes, which I'll get to in a minute, um, we will see some kind of a, a genetic difference and kind of worms grouping up by species to help identify which ones we've collected. And then we'll do, I'll do a detailed morphological study of the selected species. So whatever we collect, I'll be looking at the morphology of those and then referencing back to the type specimens um, which we get along from a museum. So to collect these fish, we've had a lot of help um, and then we got out there ourselves with our lab to angle electrofish, gill netting, seining. This is a picture of a fish intestine that I dissected open. These are all little worms inside of it, all neopenorhynchus. This is a large mouth bass from on Seagull Lake. So we're trying to get this diversity of samples. So wherever we go, we try to collect from a variety of fish hosts and then also get some geographic diversity going on. Um, and the genetics we're going to be doing is a three-gene phylogeny, so looking at three different molecular marker genes, which people may have heard of CO1, that's kind of a common barcoding gene, and I'll be looking at two others, 28S and ITS. And then we'll combine that with the morphological work in light microscopy and scanning electron microscopy. So this is, I just wanted to give you an idea of where we've sampled so far. We have a collaborator who sampled a lot of centrarchids all over the eastern half of the United States. So we kind of lucked out um, having a contact like that because he has exchanged, expanded our geographic sampling range a lot. And then with our own sampling, we've done um, concentrating sampling efforts in uh, New York and New Hampshire. For, and these fish, each fish just represents the fish family that we've sampled from there. So I have done some molecular work so far. I've kind of done my preliminary um, investigation into. So in the summer, last summer, I went to the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. This is one of the co-authors on this study with us, and she works there. So she was very helpful. I got to sequence 28S, which is a pretty large gene for 94 worms. So it was a big accomplishment to do that in just three weeks. We had kind of a concentrated effort there. And the question is, is there molecular evidence for species boundaries? Did we find anything? Because this is the first time anybody has looked at uh, genetic data for this genus, so nobody really knows what we're going to find and which gene is going to work best. So luckily, yes, we did. So as you can see in this phylogeny, don't get bogged down by each little label here, but I do want you to know that each label represents one worm from one host. So um, in this tree, really what we see is we're looking kind of for trends right now, because this is still preliminary data, is we see these five groups settle out. And they're really settling out by host group, um, and less by geography. So we have sample for this first group here. It's a really small sample size, because this was our kind of targeted, we had a few days of sample in New Hampshire, but we did get the creek chub sucker. This was the type host for that one species we, we went to New Hampshire. So that was kind of a big get for us. So creek chub suckers in New Hampshire kind of give us one group that's the most genetically divergent from all other parasite groups we found so far. Then we have white sucker hosts from New York. And then kind of intriguingly, we have this group that's white sucker hosts from New York. Then we also have the mixed group that's white sucker hosts from New York and New Hampshire. So it kind of gives us this interesting point of view on I mean, is there more than one species just from white suckers just in the Northeast? Um, which hasn't been reported before. Then we have a kind of general person in Isasa claim with some errant bluegills thrown in there. And um, then we have a very, very large centrarchid clade. This is from 20 states. So as you saw previously, all the other ones were from one state or one or two states. But this is really, really broad across 20 states, across the whole eastern half of the United States. So um, it kind of leads us to wonder what is the host specificity of this parasite? So is this one species, uh, for example, on the creek chub suckers, is that really specific and very localized? Whereas the centrarchid family, um, kind of all of them have one species across the whole of the United States, which is what had been reported before, but um, like I said, nobody's looked into it, so who knows really what the diversity is. And then, for example, we had a couple of brown bullhead that had not sexually mature worms that they were hosting, and is that just, uh, kind of an accidental infection, or are they a good host for these worms? So it gives us a lot of questions about host specificity. Now that we have the molecular information, we have to go back and look at the morphology. This is kind of the responsible systematic taxonomic approach of modern times to combine molecular information with morphology. So um, now I'm going back and I'm mounting worms that we've collected. 
collected. So, for example, this is a worm from Lala that was caught actually by Tom Brooking in Oneida Lake. Um, and we want to represent all hosts. So, right now my library consists of about 70 slides so far, trying to represent every host species that we've caught Neofenric is from. And then we do a more morphological comparison between the ones that we map and then the original type series. So this is a group of worms that was mounted in the 1930s. We have on loan from uh, the National Parasite Collection. Yes, that exists. <laughs> Actually, like thousands and thousands of specimens. Um, so this is a great resource because this gives us access to history that uh, we would never be able to have except for line drawing. So being able to put that under the scope right next to something we think might be the same species is a very big advantage. And these days, what we the advantage of uh, being in modern times is we have this really, really high quality imaging and measurement system in our lab at the SUNY Oyana Biological Field Station. So we have a high quality microscope with a high quality camera, and that gives us, you can see the image of a, that's a word of proboscis I was looking at, on the computer. So um, it's great because we can take very accurate measurements and use them as reference points. So, as I kind of mentioned with the catostomids and the centrarchids, those are the two families that are very interesting to me. They kind of popped up as these obvious, um, kind of intriguing points within the Ochinorhynchus. So, with the catostomids, the question is, it would be really interesting to study the biogeography of the hosts of parasites, because they're reported from across the U.S., and they're all from a lot of them are from catostomid hosts, so it'd be kind of interesting to track that. And then we wonder about the effects of economic importance on the centrarchid worms. Um, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. But first, let's talk about the catosomids. So here are four genera of catosomids that all have neopenarchus species described from them. And within the 33 species that are described from fish in the US, 13 of them, so over a third, are described from catosomid hosts. So clearly there's some kind of a relationship between this fish family and its parasites um, that is special. Somehow they've diverged a lot more within the catosomid host than other host families. And an interesting thing is usually catosomids are not subject to human stocking. So as Ben had said perfectly as a, I laughed actually because it was perfect um, connection to this stuff, nobody really cares about white suckers. I mean, we go to collect them and people are like, yeah, take as many as you want. So, um, so it makes it kind of fun for us because we get to look at these fish populations and by way of that their parasite populations that have been able to diverge without much human influence compared to a lot of other fish groups um, for evolutionary time, which is nice for us. And you can see all of these worms are, these are pictures I took from our scope that are worm proboscis. So the proboscis of the worm, like I referred to at the beginning of the talk, they're all on the same size scale. So you can see that this one is very, very large compared to the others. And um, just you can see the morphological diversity just in the specimens that we have. And then, kind of conversely, on the other hand, we have the centrarchid family, which is very economically important and has only had one species described from it, even since the beginning of the description of species from this genus. So we do wonder, is this all one species, this Neocynarchus cylindratus that has been described from centrarchids? Or maybe is there a little more diversity in this than we, can, than we uh, think so far? So that's where the other two genes are going to come in really handy and kind of uh, maybe parsing that out a little bit more. And we do wonder, is maybe some of this the relationship between fish stocking and parasite populations? Because as you move fish hosts around, you're moving that parasites with them. And because neopenarchus doesn't really cause that much damage to the host, you're not seeing an illness. So it's not going to bar people from moving fish around in different water bodies. Um, and <clears throat> since we see that all across the eastern half of the United States there's so little genetic diversity within centrarchid worms, um, we wonder if maybe it's because these parasite populations have been mixing so much that there's not much recognizable diversity, uh, even across such a large geographic distribution. So here on to future work. Um, <clears throat> I'll be collecting at further type localities, including Mississippi, Oklahoma, and Wisconsin. I'm a year into my degree now, so we have kind of ambitious sampling going on at the beginning of the summer before I do my next round of genetic work. Um, I'll be sequencing in that next round of work 28S, CO1, and ITS for those of the molecular uh, marker genes, like I mentioned, for 188 individuals, which so far 
I've done 94. So I'm hoping to have a little more time to do that sequencing. And then I'll be doing a species redescription of that species we collected from southeastern New Hampshire. I'm focusing on that one because it's the one that we had thought we were identifying from white suckers from Otsego Lake, which is kind of our home lake for our field station. So we wanted to kind of focus in on this and see that we have a very, very detailed account of this species and go back and see if maybe it is the one from Otsego or maybe we have even a different sucker parasite that hasn't been identified yet. And I just wanted to acknowledge there has been a lot of work going into catching all these fish and um, helping us with dissection. So thank you very much to the Senior Research Foundation, Cornell Biological Field Station, um, TUC, Scott Wells, and Tim Corning, uh, Zach Piper, Bridget O'Donnell, were our field assistants for the New Hampshire trip, and the SUNY Oneonta Biological Field Station, because that's where our facility is to do all of the imaging and slide work.
nourishing population of Neohinorhynchus, for example, then you know you have ostracods that are being eaten by either your smaller fish or maybe your bigger fish if you have trouble in your food web. Um, so it does help track kind of your smaller hosts as well as the different